Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going deep, really deep into the world of terrestrial orchids. Awesome. They're fascinating. Like, they've figured out how to thrive, but they're super rare at the same time, you know? Yeah. Our main guide for this deep dive is Simon Pierce's book, The Conservation of Terrestrial Orchids. It's uh, it's full of fascinating insights. We'll discover how orchids play hide and seek like pros, how they've developed these amazing survival tactics, and what we can actually do to help protect them. Right. It's incredible how they've carved out this like special spot in the plant kingdom. They've got a totally different approach than, say, grasses, which kind of just take over the whole landscape. Yeah, exactly. It's like this rarity paradox, right? Yeah. Pierce explains how it's not about dominating for them. It's about specializing and being really good at it. They've evolved to take advantage of those little gaps and chances that other plants leave behind. Like they've mastered this invisibility trick, surviving right in front of us, and we don't even notice. Totally. But then it makes you wonder, how do they manage to reproduce if they're spread out so much? Ah, that's where their pollination strategies come in. Yeah. Huh? They've developed these complex mechanisms that pretty much guarantee reproduction, despite their rarity. Okay, so like, walk me through this. Sure. What's going on here? So we have the pollinia, right? Right. It's not your typical pollen delivery system. Gotcha. Break it down for us. All right. So the pollinia are these packets of pollen, almost like little waxy backpacks, mm. and they attach to... Uh, to an insect that's visiting the flower. So the insect gets a little pollen backpack. Precisely. That's smart. And as the insect flies off, the stalk of this pollinia dries and cleverly changes position, which actually prevents self-pollination. Cool. Then when the insect gets to another orchid, the pollinia is perfectly lined to hit the stigma, which fertilizes the ovules, and boom, you've got seed development. Whoa, that's super efficient. Here's where things get crazy. Yeah. Pierce says that something like 36% of orchids globally, including some European varieties, have completely ditched the nectar reward. They don't even try to attract pollinators with a sweet treat. They're like the ultimate con artists of the plant world, you know? Seriously, what are some of the coolest examples of this orchid trickery that Pierce talks about? Okay, let's start with pseudocopulation. Imagine this. Ophrys orchids, or bee orchids, have evolved to look and even smell like female insects. Wait, so they're tricking the male insects into thinking they're about to mate. Exactly. The males try to mate with the flower and end up transferring pollen in the process. Piers even says that some bees have been seen ejaculating during this. Wow, that's commitment. It is. The deception doesn't stop there though, right? What else do orchids have up their sleeve? Oh, there's more. Take the Cypripedium calceolus, the slipper orchid. It has this incredible trap, kind of like a pitcher plant. Insects, drawn in by the scent and bright colors, fall into this pitcher-like structure. To escape, they have to brush against the pollen. That's sneaky. But why go to all this trouble? Isn't deception risky? You might think so, but it lets them thrive in really tough environments where resources are limited. Think about it. They don't need to waste energy constantly making nectar. Smart, not hard. Exactly. They're incredibly adaptable, built to handle environments that are constantly changing. So while grasses build defenses like silica to protect themselves from things that want to eat them, orchids are like, nope, we'll do something different. Right. Instead of resisting disturbance, they've evolved to embrace it. So it's a go underground, literally, kind of thing. Yeah, they spend most of their time hidden, coming out only when it's time to flower and reproduce. They're playing the long game. A brilliant strategy considering how some human activities have actually helped orchids. You're talking about things like coppicing and mowing, right, those traditional practices. How do they help? Imagine a forest floor where sunlight can barely reach the ground. Coppicing, which is cutting trees back to help them grow, and mowing create these open spaces that orchids love. It's fascinating how something that seems disruptive can actually be a good thing. Right. Pierce gives an example where orchids that had been dormant for years under a dense canopy suddenly bloomed after a clearing. Exactly. It shows how resilient they are and how even small changes can make a huge difference. It's a good reminder that we can actually have a positive impact on conservation. Pierce says that understanding how populations are spread out is key. Some species live in big, connected groups, while others are more fragmented. And the fragmented ones, the isolated ones, are the most at risk, right? Exactly. They're the ones most likely to experience inbreeding and lose genetic diversity over time. Pierce's research actually put orchid populations into three main types. Large and clumped, large and scattered, and small and scattered. 
Those small scattered populations are the ones that need our help and become a priority for ex situ conservation. So we've identified a population that needs help. What do we do? Some orchids can be propagated asexually, which is basically cloning them by dividing bulbs or rhizomes, but that has limitations. You're just making copies, right? Not really increasing the genetic diversity. Plus, you can only create a limited number of new plants that way. Pierce was pretty clear that for orchids, seed propagation is the way to go. Absolutely. Seed propagation has the most potential, and it all starts with hand pollination. Remember the toothpick technique Pierce described? Yeah, like playing orchid matchmaker. You carefully take the pollinia from one flower and transfer it to another. Such a simple technique, but it can make a big difference, especially for species that struggle with natural pollination. You can really boost seed production that way. Okay, so we have seeds, now what? Do we just sprinkle them out in the wild and hope for the best? Not quite. This is where we bring in in vitro cultivation. It's basically nurturing those tiny seeds in a controlled environment. A high-tech nursery for orchid babies. Pierce explains this in detail, giving the seeds the perfect balance of nutrients and moisture, even mimicking seasonal cycles to help them germinate and grow. Exactly. We're trying to replicate their natural conditions. And there are two main approaches, symbiotic and asymbiotic germination. Symbiotic germination involves those cool soil fungi that orchids depend on, right? Yes. The fungus helps break down the seed coat and gives nutrients to the seedling. But as Pierce and other researchers have found, it can be tricky and labor-intensive. And that's where asymbiotic germination comes in, giving the seeds a head start with a special nutrient-rich medium. This seems like the go-to method for a lot of conservationists. It's definitely become more popular. It's a lot more reliable, and the orchids can still form those relationships with fungi when they're put back in the wild. Like giving them a helping hand early on and then letting them go back to their roots. So our seedlings are doing well in the lab. When and how do we reintroduce them back to the wild? Timing is super important. Pierce found that transplanting orchids when they're dormant greatly increases their survival rate. Makes sense. They're less vulnerable to stress when they're dormant. And where do we plant them? Any random spot in their habitat. We want to reintroduce them to places where they've disappeared or their populations have shrunk. But there's a twist. Remember, companion plants. The ones that attract and support pollinators. So it's not just planting orchids, but restoring the whole ecosystem. Exactly. We need to consider the needs of pollinators and those companion plants. It's a holistic approach that recognizes how interconnected everything is. Pierce's work with Project Orcus is a great example. They focused on restoring whole areas of alpine and subalpine meadows, not just planting orchids. They were recreating those diverse habitats that orchids need. That's right. They even created teaching flower beds in the parks so visitors could learn about orchids and conservation. What a great way to raise awareness. Orchids face some serious threats, and a lot of it comes down to us, you know, humans. Yeah, because even with the coolest survival strategies, if their home disappears, they're in trouble, right? Absolutely. And we're talking about habitat loss, you know. Mm. Orchids, they love these open meadows. Meadows, yeah, I can picture that. And historically, these meadows were created and maintained by people. Traditional practices like coppicing and grazing. Wait, so humans actually help them? It's kind of like giving the forest a haircut, you know, preventing it from getting too overgrown and shady for these sun-loving orchids. So it's like we accidentally help them out by managing the land. Exactly. But as those old school practices decline, the woodlands, they start taking over. Oh, so it's like the forest is moving in and pushing the orchids out. Exactly. It's a good reminder that, you know, when small scale agriculture declines, it affects way more than just our food. Yeah, it's like a ripple effect, impacting these hidden ecosystems we don't always think about. Exactly. Which brings us to another question. How small is too small for an orchid population? We oh. talked about them being rare, but there's got to be a limit, right? Yeah, at some point, even with all their tricks, it won't be enough to keep them going. Right. Smaller populations, they're at a much higher risk of inbreeding. Inbreeding, meaning? You know, like closely related orchids reproducing. Oh. And that can lead to seeds that aren't as viable less likely to sprout. Oh, that makes sense. Like yeah. the gene pool gets too small or something. Exactly. And even if you have a big population, if it's too spread out, pollination becomes super challenging. So it's not just about saving land. It's about how it's managed. Right. It's about making sure those populations can connect and thrive, thinking about the whole landscape, not just isolated spots. That makes a lot of sense. So what can we do? 
Like, how do we help them when things get really bad? Well, that's where ex situ conservation comes in. Ex situ. It's like a backup plan, you know? Safeguarding orchids when their habitats are in trouble or their numbers are way too low. So we're talking about, like, taking them out of their natural environment. Yeah, think botanical gardens, seed banks. Gotcha. So like a safe haven for orchids? Exactly. Sometimes it's about restocking declining populations, and other times it's about creating these decoy plantings. Decoy plantings? What are those? It's like creating this fake orchid haven to distract people who might want to collect them from the wild. Oh, that's clever. Like a decoy, like you said, protecting the real ones by tricking people. Exactly. But even if we can grow them in the lab, getting them to survive back in the wild, that's the tricky part. Yeah, I can imagine. It's not like they can just go from test tube to forest and be fine. It takes a lot of expertise, finding the right spot, mimicking their natural conditions, and then keeping a close eye on them. Like a whole process, carefully introducing them back to their home. And it's important to remember, not all orchids are the same. Some are tough, you know. Just need a little help with their habitat. Like the ones we talked about earlier, where just cutting back some trees help them flower again. Exactly. But others, they're much more sensitive. They need that extra care, like what ex situ conservation can offer. So it's like different levels of care depending on the orchid. Exactly. And for those species that are really struggling, asymbiotic germination can be a lifesaver. It's like giving them a head start before they face the real world. That's a good way to put it. But remember, it's not just about the orchids themselves. we got to think about their pollinators, too. Oh, right. The bees and butterflies. They're essential for making more orchids. Absolutely. It's all connected. Conservation is about protecting the whole ecosystem, not just one species. So it's a bigger picture thing. Exactly. And remember those sneaky orchids, the ones that trick insects into pollinating them? They need a little help from companion plants. Companion plants. Are those like orchid uh, friends? In a way, yeah. They're plants that actually reward pollinators with nectar. So they're like the good guys, giving the insects what they want. Exactly. And by keeping those insects around, it increases the chances that those trickster orchids will get pollinated too. So it's like creating a diverse environment where everyone benefits. Exactly. It's about a thriving ecosystem where both the tricksters and the nectar providers can exist together. It's like building a little community, making sure everyone has what they need to survive. That's a great way to think about it. It's about recognizing they're part of this delicate web of life and their survival depends on the health of the whole web. So when we talk about conservation, it's not just about orchids. It's about their habitats, their pollinators, and even how we manage the land. You got it. It's this amazing combination of like ancient wisdom and cutting edge science, all to make sure orchids have a future. I'm realizing that orchid conservation is way more complex than I ever imagined. It is. But the more we learn about these secret lives of orchids, the more we understand how connected everything in nature really is. This whole orchid thing has been, I don't know, kind of mind-blowing. Right. It's like a whole secret world we never really noticed. So as we're wrapping up this deep dive, what's the one thing you really want our listeners to remember about terrestrial orchids? I think it's... um. You know, their survival really shows us how connected everything in nature is. Their fate depends on their habitat, their pollinators, and even us. Wow, that's a powerful thought. So the next time we're walking through a meadow, we should think about that hidden world under our feet. Exactly. Full of secret partnerships and clever survival strategies. It's a good reminder that beauty can be found in unexpected places, and it's up to us to protect it. It's been a blast exploring the world of orchids with you today. Likewise, I had a great time. And that's a wrap on another deep dive. We hope you enjoyed this journey into the fascinating world of terrestrial orchids. Remember, even small actions can make a big difference when it comes to conservation. So until next time, stay curious.